Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to Subpoena Power, a night of debates for the candidates seeking Oklahoma County District Attorney. We heard from the four Republican candidates seeking their party's nomination earlier, and now we welcome the two Democratic candidates to the stage. If you're just joining us, my name is Trey Savage. I'm the editor of nondoc.com. We're an independent online journalism publication. I'm on the stage with Storm Jones of News 9. And if you're uh, just joining us, you probably have found our uh, stream at News9.com and the Facebook page at News 9, 9 Doc, and other media partners. Look for fact checks from you Central Media students coming up uh, in the coming days. So candidates, choose your exaggerations carefully. All right? I, I, that would be good advice. I listed the sponsors of our 2022 debate series earlier, but I'm going to list them again because they're that important. The State Chamber of Oklahoma, AARP Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Association of Realtors, the Oklahoma Public School Resource Center, the advocacy firm of McSpadden, Milner, and Robinson, and the Overman Legal Group. Thank you all so much for believing in public debates. If you were here uh, 30 minutes ago, you saw the importance of having these conversations. We're going to have another good conversation tonight. Um, Storm. Yep, just another reminder, please share uh, the streams online so as many eyeballs can uh, be more well-informed, uh, as, as informed as we are, and also please uh, silence your phones. We're very tired, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, we're going to have two-minute <coughs> opening statements from each candidate. We'll have three rounds of questions, and then we'll also have two-minute closing statements. We flipped a coin earlier. Ms. Vicki Behenna, you get to go first. Mr. Mark Miles, you will go second. Ms. Behenna, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nondoc Media, News 9, and you Central Media for hosting this debate tonight. And Mark, thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here to have the opportunity to speak to the voters ahead of the primary on June 28th. I'm running for DA for Oklahoma County because experience matters. I was a federal prosecutor for 25 years right here in Oklahoma City. I prosecuted a multitude of crimes. I also was asked to assist in the investigation and prosecution of Timothy McVeigh. On April 19th, I was asked to be one of seven prosecutors to be on that prosecution team when it moved to Denver for the, to prosecute Timothy McVeigh. I was one of two Oklahomans on that prosecution team. We understood in that investigation that it was important to get it right. And we preserved the evidence, followed the evidence to make sure that prosecution was right. On October of 2015, I was asked and became the executive director of the Oklahoma Innocence Project. The Oklahoma Innocence Project, Project is housed at OCU School of Law, and the students work to find evidence of innocence for the clients' clinics who have been wrongfully convicted. Again, I understood the importance of getting it right, finding the evidence of innocence and presenting that evidence to a court of law. No one running for district attorney has the 360 degree view of the criminal justice system that I do. I want to bring my experience together to ensure that the criminal justice system in Oklahoma serves and protects all the citizens of Oklahoma County with integrity and fairness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Miles, two minutes to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nondoc. Thank you, Channel 9. Vicki, it's good to see you again. My name is Mark Miles. I'm running for district attorney in Oklahoma County. I'm running to advocate for justice and fairness and accountability in the criminal justice system in Oklahoma County. When I talk about justice, I'm talking about protecting public safety because at the end of the day, that's the heart of what we do as prosecutors. When I talk about fairness, I'm talking about a criminal justice system that, cre that treats everybody uh, justly, fairly, um, equitably, and with a common sense approach to, to um, uh, I've lost my train of thought um, from that perspective. And when I talk about accountability, I'm talking about holding not just the people who get charged accountable for their actions, but also holding the office of the district attorney to the highest possible standards, as well as holding our most vital partners to the highest possible standards. And our most vital partners, when I talk about them, I'm talking about the police because they're the people who bring us the cases, they're the reasons that we oftentimes win cases, sometimes they're the reasons why we lose cases, but I want them to do it the right way and I think it's incumbent upon us to do that the right way. The district attorney is the highest law enforcement officer in the county and it's where the public sees the 
impact of public policy, and it's where the rubber meets the road from that perspective. As your district attorney, I will ensure collaboration with the community, and it's something that we haven't seen for some time out of the current administration, but it's important to work with the community to go out and develop some programs because at the end of the day, if we can do that and collaborate with the community, then we can hopefully forestall or prevent some of the things that happen that bring cases to the, uh, uh, the district attorney's office. So that means being accessible, and I commit to being accessible. That means being available, and that means listening to the community leaders. Great, thank, thank you. you. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you. Off. Well, thank you, Mr. Miles. I'm sorry. I guess I'm in a hurry to get out of here tonight after all this debate. Uh, round of applause real quick for the opening statement. <laughs> if you put the bottle that way. There we go. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's get to our first round of questions. This one is titled, What Would a Pro Say? I still think that's funny. Also, pro say, huh? uh, each candidate Prefer. will get 90 seconds to answer each question. Storm. I even got that one. Hey, uh, this first question will go to Ms. Behenna. Where did you go to law school and what was the most important lesson you learned? 90 seconds. I went to OCU School of Law. Um, the most important lesson I think I learned in law school was that the law is not black and white. Uh, that there are a lot of gray areas in the law. And within that, a lawyer has to operate with integrity. Ethics was a very big subject when I was in law school, understanding professional ethics and the responsibility of a prosecutor to always present, or not just a prosecutor, but a lawyer in general, general to always present the facts fairly and equally and justly, and not to lie to the court of law not to lie to opposing counsel. And so ethics, as I said, was probably the most important lesson that I learned in law school. Mr. Miles, same question. Where did you go to law school and what was the most important lesson? I went to the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Uh, I went later in life. Um, I had a career. Um, actually, I was at IBM for 21 years before I went to law school, so I was a little bit older when I went to law school. So ethics, obviously, was one of the most important things and the things that circle around um, being ethical when you, uh, when you practice as an attorney. And one of the things that I've never done, and I don't know that they actually taught it to you in that way, but I've never lied to a judge. And I think that's important. There's people out there that will say to stretch the truth, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, one of my uh, law professors was a guy by the name of Andy Coates. Some of you may remember him. He was a former um, district attorney in Oklahoma County, and he and I share uh, uh, the same distinction in that uh, we both were um, losing candidates for uh, another political position once upon a time. But uh, the thing that he said uh, that uh, he also taught was, uh, at the end of the day, if anybody's going to go to jail, you want it to be your client. That's, that was kind of I, a joke, but that's the way it was. It right. took me a second to get the joke. Okay, Mr. Miles, I've got another question for you. Let's talk about prosecutors specifically. Okay. Uh, name a prosecutor whom you like, and if you could build a dream office uh, as, a, as a district attorney, whom you would offer a job. What is it about them that you admire? A prosecutor in real life or a prosecutor in uh, on, on I was thinking of humans. <laughs> <laughs> um, I worked with a guy named Andrew Benedict. Uh, Andrew was a prosecutor. Uh, he's in private practice now. Andrew came to Caddo County and uh, uh, was an assistant district attorney out there. And before he left uh, that office, he was probably the, um, he was the lead attorney essentially out there for uh, the Caddo County District Attorney's Office, which actually encompasses f uh, four different counties. Um, Andrew has and had, well, he had at the time, he continues to have a, a common sense approach to the law. And uh, he was able to look at a case, uh, evaluate a case properly. He understood what it was worth and uh, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. And he recognized when there was wrongdoing on the side of law enforcement that maybe made a case more suspect. And I admired him for what he did. He's actually a younger attorney than me in terms of the number of years that he's actually been an attorney, but I would offer him a job any day, and, and I have emulated him, I think, as a prosecutor because of, I've done that job as well, but Andrew Benedict. Thank you very much. Ms. Behenna, the same question to you. And the question is, who was my favorite or prosecutor that I liked and why? Yeah, just somebody okay. you uh, would, would offer a job to because you uh, think highly of them and why. 
Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk hypothetically, but specifically. Obviously, I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office for 25 years. I worked with a number of career prosecutors in that office, and it would be unfair for me to select one of those as a person that I liked best above the others, because I think it's, I, I can say truthfully that every one of the prosecutors that I worked with understood the role of a prosecutor was to seek justice first, to follow the evidence, and whatever the, wherever that evidence led, to file the appropriate charges, and to make appropriate sentencing recommendations based upon the defendant that was in front of them. And so I don't want to, if you will allow me, not to sp pick a specific prosecutor, but more to refer to all the prosecutors that I worked with in the U.S. Attorney's Office that understood the role of a prosecutor and the effect that that prosecutor can have if they make a wrong decision on the lives of people that are charged in the criminal justice system. Well, it's your unlucky day because I am going to make you name somebody. Give us one name, somebody okay. you like. You know what I'll do? I'll name two because they're sitting here in this audience. Perfect. I'll name Carrie Kelly and Dan Weber. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> oh, Mr. Weber, we get to meet finally. Good, good to meet you. Um, okay, terrific. Uh, Storm, next question. All righty, this next question will go to Ms. Behenna first. Uh, and it's a lengthy one, so. Uh, an absurd and aggravating string of events has called into the culture of the Oklahoma County Courthouse in recent years from an Oklahoma City police detective saying he perjured himself in signing an affidavit about a police shooting. Former Judge Kendra Coleman was removed from office. Former Judge Tim Henderson resigned and remains under criminal investigation for alleged sexual misconduct involving ADAs, which, he ra which has also raised questions about dozens of past convictions. With all this drama and more, how can Oklahoma County residents trust justice will be served? And is it a matter of personal ethics for the individuals, or does there need to be a broader effort to hold people in the criminal justice system to a higher standard? 90 seconds. Okay, well that's, that's a lot, so let me try to unpack that. I'm running for district attorney because I believe the tone of an office is set by the person at the top of that chain. There are rules that prosecutors have to abide by, and the district attorney has to ensure that those, that guidance is set within that office. I don't know the specific facts about Judge Henderson or Judge Coleman and the things that surrounded that. I, I'm aware of the police officer that said that he uh, made a false statement on his affidavit. But what I can tell you is that there will be an expectation in the DA's office the day I walk in that prosecutors operate with integrity. And if things happen where there are personal relationships within the office, personal relationships between uh, judges or defense counsel, those issues will be addressed by me specifically because it does affect the integrity of the criminal justice system. People have lost trust in the criminal justice system, and they have to know that everybody is gonna be held accountable, prosecutors and staff within the DA's office, including citizens of Oklahoma County who are gonna be held responsible for criminal charges. Mr. Miles, 90 seconds, how do you clean it up? Same question. Uh, when I announced I was running for district attorney, I said that accountability was going to be one of the issues. And when I said accountability, I meant that holding the office of the district attorney to the highest possible standards, as well as the other people who encompass that. Um, talking about the things you raised, I'm aware of the Judge, Judge Henderson issues. Um, obviously, there's some serious questions about what actually happened there. We don't know. But as the district attorney, I will address any inappropriate and personal relationships between the staff and the court. Um, and when I say the court, I mean by judges. Um, with regards to other issues, it's not, it, it, I heard, you know, I think both of us are running because a lot of the people here saw the last debate. And we think, both of us think that we're probably better suited to be able to run the office than the parties on the other side. But those are my personal feelings, and I think she feels the same way. It's incumbent upon us as the leaders in the office to work to ensure that the culture is understood that we're gonna do things the right way all the time, whether it's 
with prosecutors and we don't have to win every case. You know, somebody bragged, we won 100% of our cases. The goal isn't to necessarily win every case. The goal is to get it right. And sometimes getting it right is losing a case. And that's not a problem. So we'll do it the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Miles, first to you this question. Uh, one of the strong and controversial powers of America's criminal justice system is civil asset forfeiture, a process by which law enforcement and district attorneys uh, can seize private property, such as cash or vehicles, on behalf of the government without charging or prosecuting uh, the suspects with crime. To what extent and when would you, as district attorney, uh, authorize civil asset forfeiture? I've handled a number of cases of civil asset forfeiture uh, over the years. The, I don't know if I can get through the story in 90 seconds. Is it, it's 90 seconds, right? Well, we'll let you try. Western <laughs> Oklahoma, uh, Cattle County, uh, Desert Storm. Um, the DA in Southwest Oklahoma came up with an idea basically to generate revenue for the office. And what he did was he went out and he hired private contractors to come to Oklahoma and drive police cars in Oklahoma. They weren't cleat certified. They pulled people over on the highway uh, who were people of color, who were driving out of state cars and they would pull them over and they would find a reason to get into the car and if they found money they would seize it. If they found guns they would seize them. If they found drugs they would take them to jail and they filed civil forfeitures against all of those. It, it, it's inappropriate from that perspective. The Supreme Court has said that if you are pursuing civil forfeitures as a, as, as a form of punishment against the people, it's inappropriate. It falls under the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment of the, uh, of the United States Constitution. So that's not going to be the primary focus of what I do if I'm elected as a district attorney in Oklahoma County. But there still might be some instances when you would consider it appropriate? What would there still be? may. Well, um, I can think of an, an instance where if you've got somebody who's a significant drug trafficker, who has significant property, um, as an example, driving down a highway um, with a tractor trailer full of drugs and, and money associated with it, I think that it would be appropriate in a situation like that. But for the individual person, everyday run of the mill, where you take their car and it's their only mode of transportation because they've got a marijuana butt in the car, that's inappropriate. That's happened in the past. It should not happen. Ms. Behenna, 90 seconds, same question to you. You know, so the Supreme Court has determined that asset forfeiture, civil and criminal asset forfeiture, is an important and useful punishment. And because it deprives those who are using illegal activity to gain assets, money included. But as I will say many times during this debate, and we've all talked about before, evidence and facts matter. You cannot see somebody's assets and money in their car without having evidence that that money is tied to some criminal activity. So there has to be a nexus between those two things. You can't just take money because you suspect somebody um, is doing illegal activity. You actually have to have evidence of that. And so while asset forfeiture is a sanctioned and appropriate punishment in the right case, it's the facts that make a district attorney decide whether or not it's an appropriate case. So again, the facts matter. I would make sure that law enforcement, if they're pulling people over, that they're using probable cause to believe the person was involved in criminal activity before they pull them over, or they do a search of a car to find assets in the car. So as I said, facts matter, and that's always what I'm going to come back to here. Thank you very much. That's the end of round one. Let's give a round of applause to both our candidates. <clears throat> our, um, like in the first debate, our uh, second round of questions is called the police and the jail. And uh, we're going to start with the same show of hands we had in the last debate, Storm. On June 28th, the same day that you all will be on the ballot, Oklahoma County voters will be asked to approve or reject $260 million in bonds for the construction of a new county jail. Raise your hand if you will be voting yes on that question. So, All right, Ms. Behenna, why? And then Mr. Miles, why are you voting yes, ma'am? Have you been to the county jail? I have. It's been an evening in there for a story. I, I wouldn't want my friends, my family members, to spend one night in that jail. And what we know is that many people are spending much more time than one a day or one hour in that jail. It is unsanitary. 
It is unclean. There is not medical assistance for the people that need medical assistance. There's not mental health assessments in that jail. We need a new jail. It's not working. I went to uh, a Chamber of Commerce forum this afternoon uh, at lunch where I heard the Chamber uh, members, in particular it was Jim Couch and um, the Commissioner, talk about why they need a new jail. Now, I'm not an economic um, development lawyer. I don't understand the financing part. I intend to read up on that a little bit more, but it is unquestionable that Oklahoma County needs a new jail. Mr. Miles, you indicated you won't be supporting the bond. Well, actually, I, I'm undecided at this point. Um, I've been in the jail. Uh, I was locked in the jail visiting with uh, one of my clients years ago for about two hours because nobody came and got me when we were done from about 2 o'clock in the morning to about 4 o'clock in the morning. And that highlights one of the problems with the jail in that they're understaffed. Uh, the people who work there are underpaid. There aren't enough of them. Uh, did, I will agree that the jail is a horrible place. It's, it's not clean. It's not sanitary. Uh, there's too many people in it. Obviously, it's overcrowded. I hope to address part of that problem if I'm elected as the district attorney by advocating for bonds that are more reasonable, that are fair, that are attainable for people so that we can get rid of some of the overcrowding, which is one of the issues that we have with the jail. Now, with regards to the specifics of the, of the bond itself, um, we actually don't know how much the jail is going to cost. I think they want to raise $260 million, but we don't know how much it's actually going to cost. We don't know how long it's going to take to build it. We don't know where it's going to be. Uh, so there's a lot of issues with regards to that. With regards to the funding, my understanding is, and I also need to delve into that, um, we've got a pretty good credit rating in Oklahoma County, but uh, my understanding is the, the, the rate of interest on the uh, measure uh, that's going to be put before the people is uh, much higher than probably what market rates are. So I'm undecided about that. I think we could do a better job by building a new mental health facility to address the issues that uh, the jail has. We're 13 days away. We're, we're 13 days away, though, from the election. I, I, I don't know that, is there going to be something that happens between now and then that kind of sways you one way or the other? I, I, I'm not, and I'm not asking you as, you know, uh, trying to violate the Australia rule, right, of telling us your ballot, but I'm curious where you lean on this. Where do you, where, uh, do you want I, your supporters the, to I'll, to I'll concede that we need a new jail, for, for starters, okay? I will tell you that because we've been busy doing other things. I'm still a practicing attorney while I'm campaigning. I haven't done all of the research to be able to make an informed decision. And all I'm saying is everybody needs to make an informed decision when they decide whether they're going to vote yes or no on it. And I've supported typically all of the things that have been put before the taxpayers, like all of the MAPS issues in the past. I'm going to look at it and I'm going to make an informed decision. This seems like a little bit of a difference. Ms. Behenna, 30 seconds, if you'd like it, to talk, uh, you know, to rebut what you're hearing. Well, I, I wish we would have the opportunity to have more information between now and June 28th. The fact is that we do not. And, uh, you know, listening to people, the jail trust, and the individuals that are involved in the jail and what they're wanting to do, I mean, I understand that that it's, it's something that maybe the citizens would like to have a little more detail on before they vote. It's not going to happen, and we need a new jail, and that's the bottom line. Thank you very much. Uh, Storm, you yeah. have the next question. Uh, this next question will start with Ms. Behenna. Uh, cash bail is used by the court to help ensure defendants will appear for trial when released from jail, but some people simply cannot pay their portion of the bail, and it means they stay in Oklahoma County for months or longer, which keeps them away from their families and puts their jobs at risk. What is your philosophy on using cash bail, and would you charge, uh, change any bail practices within Oklahoma County's district attorney's office if you're elected? Yeah, you know, I, I had a meeting with Bob Rabbits, who's in the public defender's office, about this issue and about how bond is set in Oklahoma County. And it's my understanding that in years past, um, the public defender's office and the DA would get together and they would schedule bond for certain offenses. Um, that hasn't happened in a long time. And it needs to. There needs to be a dialogue. When, when we're talking about an individual being charged with a particular crime and setting a bond schedule for those particular crimes, um, that needs to be done in consultation with the public defender's office so that advice can be given to the judge in determining that bond to be set. I think more people should have the ab availability to be able to get out on OR bonds. 
If somebody is a nonviolent offender, um, coming up with $200 to be able to cash, put that money forward to be able to get a bondsman, to be able to get out of jail so they can go back to their job and, and um, continue to work and support their family, sometimes it's too much. I understand also that sometimes when the DA's office doesn't charge somebody within the requisite 120 days and those charges aren't filed and the bond is exonerated, that individual can then, uh, and if charges are filed later, that individual might have to put up another $200 to get another bondsman to bond them out on that charge that's just been filed. It is, it, it's unfair. In the federal system, we have a system where we look at the individual and uh, whether or not they're a flight risk and a danger to community, and those facts are considered when we set bond. For the folks at home, owe our own recognizance? Yes. No, no cash paid? No cash. Mr. Miles, uh, two minutes, same question. So I am an advocate for making bonds more reasonable, attainable, and affordable. And when we talk about the goal is, for a lot of people out there, is no cash bond. The way we do it in the federal system is an evaluation is made as to whether or not a person is a risk to public safety. So if they're charged with a really serious crime, they're either they're probably not going to get out. Um, or if they're a flight risk, as in what is the likelihood that they're not going to come back to court. In Oklahoma County, we have a bond schedule. It is basically printed up, and a judge looks at it, and if a person's charged with a certain crime, he goes down a list, oh, first-degree burglary, uh, $50,000, and, you know, that's it. Okay, so that's how it works. In other counties, and I practice in a lot of other counties, and when I was a prosecutor up in Logan County, the prosecutors made the individual decision by assessing the individual facts for the case to make the determine as to what the make a determination as to what the bond should be for that particular person. And usually, whatever the prosecutor says, this is what I recommend, is what the judge says, this is what it's going to be. So we have uh, a statute in the state of Oklahoma that allows for OR bonds. I'm an advocate for getting rid of the schedule in Oklahoma County, figuring out how to assess each and everything so that we can make an informed decision about whether or not a person should have to put up money to be able to get out of jail or should they be the recipient of an OR bond. And there are some programs within Oklahoma County that allow for a person to get out on an OR bond, but typically they have to stay in jail for a while. When a person goes to jail, it has the potential to ruin their lives because they could lose their job, they could miss the rent payment, they could have everything taken away from them, and we need to be cogniz cognizant of that as prosecutors when somebody's charged with a crime. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miles. I've got the next question for you. I have, in the meantime, learned through two debates that if you put the water bottle that way, it will uh, not roll off the thing, so that might be <laughs> helpful to you. Um, since 2020, current District Attorney David Prater has filed charges against at least seven Oklahoma County jail employees for allegations that include falsifying records related to suicide, smuggling contraband, assault and battery, and uh, in one instance, uh, force, or I think multiple instances, forcing uh, individuals who are handcuffed to a wall and making them list to baby shark on repeat. Uh, has Mr. Prater done enough to seek justice for the dozens of people who have died in the Oklahoma County Jail in recent years, or is there something else a DA needs to do to hold jail administrators and the jail trust accountable? You're asking me to be critical of a person who is essentially the attorney for the jail, which they're kind of at odds with each other um, from that perspective. Um, the issues with the jail are issues in the jail because of the administration of the jail, the inability to hire enough people, the inability to pay people the way they're supposed to be paid. Uh, the district attorney is responsible for the charging decision, and if people are breaking the law, they should be charged. Um, is he doing enough? It's hard to say. People are still dying of fentanyl overdoses in a jail. That's a problem. You know, when somebody's arrested on the charge of larceny and then they die in the Oklahoma County Jail because of a fentanyl overdose, that's a problem. Now, you can't point to the district attorney for that problem. It's a problem with the overall administration of the jail. It's kind of a separate issue. If charges are appropriate, charges should be filed. I have no problem with him filing charges. If he files more charges, is that going to change anything? I think the answer is probably no. They're still going to have the same issues with not having enough people, not paying them enough, et cetera, et cetera, and all the other incumbent problems that accompany the jail at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Behenna, the same question to you. Uh, is, is there enough being done to seek justice for the people who 
uh, have died and, and faced other uh, fates in the jail, or is there something else the DA needs to do to hold jail administrators and the governing body, the jail trust, responsible? Yeah. Well, I, I, um, let me answer the question by first addressing the correctional officers and whether or not they should be charged for bringing contraband into um, the jail. Correctional officers are hired to do a very difficult job, and I understand that. And I understand that they don't get always the best and brightest candidates sometimes because of how difficult it is to be a correctional officer. But when somebody takes on the role of being a correctional officer, they are in a position of trust. They are in a position to take care of the inmates or the detainees that are there in that jail. I don't know if any of you know this, but almost 80% of the people that are detained in the Oklahoma County Jail today have not been convicted. These are people that are being held pre-trial. And so correctional officers have to be held to a particular standard. And as district attorney, I would charge correctional officers that brought contraband into the office or into jail. I can tell you a real quick story. I had a case recently where my client showed up at a court hearing high on methamphetamine, and he had been in, not the Oklahoma County Jail, but the Tulsa County Jail. Now, how is it possible, how is there not an investigation to determine how that contraband got into the jail? It's the same problem with fentanyl that we have now in Oklahoma County Jail. People are dying of using fentanyl or methamphetamine or any other illicit drug there ought to be a darn good investigation to figure out how it got there, because I can tell you the detainees didn't bring it in. So are we, is the DA currently doing enough? Does more need to be done? Does, uh, you know, a point need to be made? I mean, what is the role of the district attorney? And, and I'm not saying it is or isn't, I'm just curious your thoughts. Uh, the role of the district attorney is to investigate those kinds of incidents, for sure. I don't know who's accountable because I don't know the facts of those cases, but an investigation definitely needs to be done. Thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> next question uh, begins with Ms. Behenna. One of your potential re Republican opponents has pledged to drop charges on Oklahoma City police officers who Mr. Prater, the current DA, is prosecuting for the shooting death of 17-year-old Stavian Rodriguez. Mr. Prater has charged several police officers with crimes during his time in office. How do you balance partnering with police departments to protect the public with the DA's obligation to seek justice for people allegedly mistreated by the police? Two minutes. I come from a law enforcement family. As I said, I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office for 25 years. My husband, who is here tonight, was an OSBI agent for 25 years, retired from that and went to work for the FBI. And so I think if you talk to most law enforcement officers, they will tell you that law enforcement officers want to keep good cops and good law enforcement officers and get rid of law enforcement officers that will not abide by the rule of law. I'm gonna tell this audience exactly what I told the, the FOP when I was visiting with them a couple of weeks ago. If a police officer abides by his training and uses appropriate force, he has nothing to fear from the district attorney's office. But a police officer who uses excessive force and doesn't abide by his training will be investigated like any other murder or shooting incident in Oklahoma County. And so as the district attorney, I think there's an understanding between the district attorney and law enforcement. And I think that they understand that a district attorney has to investigate those kinds of cases. Understanding that we can continue to work together, they can continue to be, bring cases because as I said before, I don't think that there's a police officer that is serving now that wants a bad cop on the force. I've pledged to work with the Oklahoma City Police Department and the other local police departments to build that trust and communication between the district attorney's office and them. And I think that will continue to work forward as the district attorney, even though I might investigate law enforcement officers for actions that they decide to take. 
Quick follow-up question. You said there's an understanding between law enforcement and the district attorney. I think if you were to ask the FOP right now, they would not be so understanding with Mr. Prater's charging decisions recently. Is the balance uh, appropriate now, or is it tilted one way or the no. other in regards and, to prosecuting officers? And I misspoke. What I meant is when I take over. I mean, I've already started that dialogue with law enforcement officers, trying to understand the problems that they have. I think they feel that their cases are not being reviewed by the DA's office, that charges are not being made or filed quick enough. And so that's what I'm talking about. I think, and I absolutely agree, that if you ask law enforcement officers now in Oklahoma County, they would say that there is not a good relationship with the DA's office. I want to work toward that. We have to work collaboratively. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miles, same question. How do you balance that uh, partnership with the DA's obligation to seek justice mis for folks mistreated by police? Again, I've talked about accountability. And the issue, obviously, there's an issue right now between, or a perceived issue between uh, law enforcement and the district attorney's office, and, and that's unfortunate. Charges should be filed where charges are appropriate. What I've uh, been convicted to do, what I have, have, have pledged to do, is to work and collaborate with law enforcement to say, we want you to do things, we want you to do them the right way, we want, you to, we want to hold you to the highest standards because it's important to us. It helps us to be able to successfully prosecute cases. And I'm committed to making sure that all of them have the highest possible training, that we do everything we can to make sure that they're properly trained, they do things the right way, and that will help ensure that when they encounter a situation, right, and they encounter all kinds of situations, but when they encounter a stressful situation, that they resort to their training to do the right thing. And I've got a case right now, I'll give you an example, of a guy who was shot by an Oklahoma City police officer. Uh, he was shot with his AR-15. Uh, the guy who was shot actually had a gun. There were two officers who responded to that scene. The second officer who was there came around the car with his gun drawn. The guy had already been shot, and he had his gun leveled on the guy, and he saw that he didn't have the gun in his hand, so he didn't shoot him. He would have died if he'd had a gun in his hand. Okay? That's not necessarily an application of or, or a misuse of force in that situation, but his training kicked in, and he made a good decision. And my goal is to make sure that they have the best possible training so they know that when they encounter certain situations, they know what to do, they can default to that. If they're doing something wrong, that's a separate case, a separate issue, and if charges are appropriate, they're going to be charged. Thank you, Mr. Miles. Uh, there has been some debate about the process and timeline of, for law enforcement officers to review body camera footage after critical incidents. The county sheriff's office policy allows deputies to review their camera footage prior to being questioned by investigators. OKCPD initially had the same policy, but an independent consultant recommended con conducting the interviews prior to letting officers review footage. Which order do you favor and why? If a, an officer reviews his body cam footage prior to being interviewed, it will allow that person to probably better provide a truer indication of what actually happened versus if an officer is interviewed first and then reviews his body camera footage later. Um, the, the issue is, are they telling the truth when they tell their story ultimately, and ultimately the truth will come out as a consequence of the body cam footage if the body cam is properly working. So it, it, it shouldn't matter from my perspective. It shouldn't matter. Um, and as I stand up here and think about it kind of on the fly, um, that I default back to they're going to have an opportunity to make a statement one way or the other, whether it's with their body cam footage or without their body cam footage. Uh, we want them to get it right. Um, if they get it wrong, and, and the issue is probably if they get it wrong and then we find out way down the road that they lied, that's where the issue arises. And um, so maybe they should review their body cam footage up front so they can get their story right. Now, if they change their story after the body cam footage comes out, um, even after they've seen it because they're trying to cover something up, again, that's a separate issue that we would have to deal with down the road. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Behenna, which order do you prefer? Yeah, you know, that, that's an interesting question. And as we're discussing this, my, my first instinct, I think, is to say, well, no, they shouldn't review their body cam footage first. Uh, but I do know that when people are operating in a stressful situation, they don't remember facts. 
I mean, it's the very reason why two eyewitnesses to an incident can remember an accident, for instance, absolutely differently from different perspectives. So I think in order for me to be able to answer this appropriately and fully informed, I would want to talk to law enforcement officers and maybe even these outside advisors who advise the police department on these issues to kind of get their perspective. I mean, the body cam doesn't lie. If it's turned on, when it's supposed to be turned on, the body cam doesn't lie. And so somebody, uh, you know, makes up a story about what happens before the body camera started. I, you know, I don't know if those if that's a possibility. I, I just feel that in order for me to properly address this issue, uh, it would probably be important for me to understand the reasons why um, they felt that body camera should not be viewed before the officer gives a statement. Again, only because I feel that it's a stressful situation and maybe somebody's memory wouldn't, wouldn't um, they just wouldn't remember everything that happened until they had a chance to see that. Yeah, I'm gonna, so I'm on the fence with that. I'm going to clarify a little bit and give you both 15 seconds if you okay. want to add anything else. I think the, the, the recommendation is the argument that in, just as you said, during that incident, adrenaline's up, people don't remember exactly right. every little detail. And the concern is that after, if they review the footage first before they give a statement, then, you know, possibly are they trying to explain what they remember based on now what they've just seen? not exactly, here's what I was remembering, here's what I was thinking, here's what I believed, uh, you know, which is the question, right? What is the state of mind, the decision-making process? So 15 seconds to either of you if, if, if that helps clarify what the debate about the issue is. Well, I'll go first, I'll let you go second. Um, the, the issue is, do they remember what happened and do they get it right? At the end of the day, we want them to get it right. That's an argument for reviewing the body cam footage. They may look at the body cam footage and find out that they really screwed up and maybe that's what the issue is, and then they try to cover something up, and that's where the issue continues. So we want them to get it right. The best way for them to get it right is let's look at the body cam footage and, and see what it says and go from there. 15 seconds, any thoughts? No, I, I mean, I understand the issue. Um, uh, and again, I think for me to answer this appropriately and fully, I, I want to understand and think about um, the, the pros and cons of each of those. Wonderful. That's the end of our second round of questions. Thank you very much. We're going to have our third round of questions titled A Prosecutor's Politics. We are going to have, we did phrase these questions in a way to have you both kind of answer. Um, but first, we do have another show of hands. Uh, we've asked you and your Republican opponents about important issues tonight because Trace and I believe public debates matter. With that in mind, raise your hand if you'll commit to debating the Republican nominee in the general election. Oh, that'd be Gladly. easy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, we'll see you all back here in october or something like that. All righty. But before we get there um, to the general election, one of you must win the Democratic primary. Mr. Miles, in 2018, you were the de facto Democratic nominee for attorney general. But six weeks before the general election, more than 20 prominent uh, of fellow Democrats uh, announced their endorsement of Mike Hunter, the Republican candidate. If the Democratic establishment in the state supported a Republican over you in 2018, how can you convince voters you can win this year? Well, I don't know that the people who supported my uh, opponent, Mr. Hunter, at that time uh, uh, reflected the will of the people of Oklahoma County. Because in Oklahoma County, I got 48% of the vote um, in basically a red wave state. You know, the Republicans won every single county. So I don't know that their individual feelings um, really impacted my race that much, probably impacted the governor's race uh, more than my race. Um, Oklahoma County historically has elected uh, people from the Democratic Party as the district attorney. Uh, it's an important race. Uh, the reason it's an important race is because the district attorney in Oklahoma County has the potential and the opportunity to investigate corruption at the state capitol. And that's the reason why the Republicans really want to win this race, because they, we've got kind of an autocratic governor here um, who wants to handpick the people that are out there around him, and he would rather not have somebody or anybody looking over his shoulder. So I don't think that that's necessarily going to be an issue from, from the perspective of our, of our race. I think that uh, the Democrats, the true Democrats, are going to come out and support us, and I think that our message probably resonates more with the independents out there 
And when you look at the independents and the Democrats uh, in Oklahoma County, from a demographic perspective, uh, the numbers certainly favor our side. Ms. Behenna, whom did you vote for in November 2018, Mr. Miles or Mr. Hunter, and why? Um, I believe I voted for Mr. Hunter, um, and primarily because of his experience of having been in that office. As I said, a prosecutor's role is not to step in, I mean, a prosecutor can't be somebody like in this DA's race where we have somebody on the Republican side who's running as a politician. And I think the role of a prosecutor takes experience, understanding what the role of a prosecutor is. And so um, I, I didn't know Mr. Miles at that time. I didn't know anything about his background and experience. And so based upon that and knowing that Mr. Hunter had been in that job and had the experience, I voted for him. Thank do you I very much. Do, um, I get a, do I get 15 seconds? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. sounds good. So um, I was hired to be a prosecutor in Logan County because the DA up there wanted somebody who could walk in day one and try a case. And he had somebody up there who uh, worked for him uh, who, when the day of trial came, uh, he called in sick. So he hired me. I could walk in day one and try a, try a case. And I did that. And uh, that's all I'll say. Thanks. Wonder, uh, yeah, Ms. Behenna, uh, I, it strikes me that uh, Mr. Hunter ended up resigning suddenly uh, amid some questions about uh, some of the things he was doing perhaps politically with his office. Um, you know, there are various conversations that have been reported about. It. Do you regret that decision now? Do you I'm think he did a good say job? I always get it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I have the next question for you. Um, in 2008, and it turns to a somber topic, your son, Michael, uh, fatally shot a naked man he was questioning about a roadside bomb in, in Iraq. Uh, a military court convicted him of unpremeditated murder, even though he argued the man had attempted to take his weapon. In 2019, then-President Donald Trump pardoned your son after advocacy from yourself and other Oklahoma political leaders, such as Mr. Hunter. Still, former President Trump is not popular among Democrats who will vote in the 20, uh, June 28th election. How do you convince Democrats of your Democratic bona fides if they ask you your opinion of former President Trump? Well, okay. Um, let me say this with regard and correct you on some facts with regard to Michael. Please. Okay. So one of the things that having been a federal prosecutor and understanding the ethical obligations of a prosecutor, one of the things that was absolutely improper in Michael's case is that, I mean, you said that, that you know, he alleged that it was self-defense here, or that he was shooting this man. The forensic evidence supported that Michael shot in self-defense, that the man was standing at the time he was shot. We didn't figure that out. We didn't know about that until after Michael was convicted. The prosecutors were well aware of their, their forensic expert had told them that they believed that this was self-defense and that Michael shot in self-defense, but that evidence was not turned over until Michael was convicted. That is an absolute unethical and unconstitutional violation by a prosecutor to withhold exculpatory evidence that could help a defendant in his defense of his case or at his sentencing. One of the reasons I went to the Oklahoma Innocence Project is because I understood the types of mistakes that can happen in prosecutions that can lead to innocent people getting convicted of crimes that they should not be convicted of. It was Michael that got me to fight for two men from the north side of Tulsa who were convicted of first degree murder with absolutely no evidence and to work to find evidence to find them innocent of those crimes. I would fight for my son in the situation that he was in any day of the week as I would fight for anybody else who felt that they were wrongfully convicted and there was evidence to prove their innocence. And uh, your thoughts on, you know, former President Trump? Because you know, cer certainly, yeah. you uh, you know, you appreciate the decision he made in that regard. You know, 
I am not a Trump supporter, if that's what you want me to say. I live in a divided household. My husband is a Republican, I'm a Democrat. I didn't vote for Trump, if that's what you want me to say. Am I eternally grateful that he pardoned my son? Of course I am. I would be grateful if he pardoned to half the clients in the Oklahoma Innocence Project as well, or if the governor would do it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Miles. Um, <laughs> We heard, uh, you know, uh, we talked about Mr. Hunter just a minute ago. Does Ms. Mahinda's uh, connection to some, you know, powerful, influential uh, Republican folks in the state, is that something Democratic voters should find concerning, or can that be an asset for a Democrat to win this seat in November? It's not concerning to me uh, from the perspective of, as a parent, uh, any parent would fight to the ends of the earth for their child. Um, my wife's parents did that for her brother. And so I understand where she was, and I know that she appreciates what happened. Um, and the fact that it was Donald Trump is, he was the president at the time. So, you know, if Joe Biden had been there, he'd probably done the same thing. Um, if uh, Barack Obama was there, he probably would have done the same thing. Uh, with regards to whether or not it's an asset, um, I called, um, Ms. Bahanna's son, actually, not the one who was charged, but her other son, I think it's Brett, is it Brett? And uh, talked to him um, after I got into the race. And I said, she was probably better suited to run for attorney general uh, than I was, because I think her story probably resonates with more of the people of the state of Oklahoma with regards to what happened with her son than, uh, than, uh, than it will be an asset necessarily in Oklahoma County. So that's my perspective on it. 15 seconds, anything? I don't think I have any follow-up. Okay, no worries. Uh, Storm. Yeah, Mr. Miles, uh, what does a Democrat have to do to win this race in November, and why are you the best candidate to appeal to not only Democrats but moderates as well? Well, we just have to campaign. Uh, we have to go door-to-door. -door. We have to talk to people. I think our message is a better message. Uh, some of the people here heard what the Republicans, the people campaigning as Republicans, had to say, and by and large, it's a law and order, lock them up kind of mentality. Uh, we haven't talked about racial justice at all tonight. Um, one in three black men versus, one in three black men in the United States can expect to be incarcerated over the course of their lifetime versus one in 17 white men. In Oklahoma, uh, where uh, blacks are 12% of the population, they comprise 40% of the people in the Department of Corrections. And then we add in people who are Hispanic. It's a small percentage, but it's a much greater percentage um, as reflected in DOC. And then when you add in Native Americans, it's the same. And then when you add in um, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transsexuals, uh, people who identify as queers, um, it's the same. Uh, the percentages are way up here. We are, well, in my perspective, and, and she may mirror me in, in some of those regards, I'm campaigning from the perspective of making Oklahoma, instead of making Oklahoma the number one state for incarceration, let's make Oklahoma the number one state for diversion programs. And I think that resonates with a lot of people. There's no reason why we should spend $24,000 a year or more locking as many people up as we can when people who are arguably guilty of a nonviolent offense can be better managed somewhere else. And if we're the number one program or number one from the perspective of diversion programs, we have programs to address a lot of those issues. We have drug courts, we have DUI courts, we have mental health courts. Mental health, mental health is a big, big issue. We have veterans courts, we have programs for women so that women don't have to be locked up. And uh, I think that message alone resonates with a lot of the people out there. And if we can do that job and do it right and do it well, we can fix a lot of the problems in the state of Oklahoma. Ms. Bahena, what does a Democrat have to do to win this race in November? Well, I, I guess um, we have forgotten that David Prater won as a Democrat. Um, so this is not a political office. This is not a positioning office. This is an office, as I've said before, of experience, somebody who understands the in and outs of the criminal justice system is the person that ought to be elected as district attorney. I've seen the criminal justice system from all sides. I've seen it as a prosecutor. I've seen it as a defense lawyer. I've seen it having a family member go through the criminal justice system and the pain and the concern that that causes. 
I've also seen the criminal justice system from the wrongful conviction point and what happens when we don't get it right. We have got a good criminal justice system, we, it, but we're human beings and we make mistakes and we have to understand what those mistakes are. So the importance of the DA is not whether or not they're a Democrat or a Republican, but who is the person that has the best experience to understand the charging decisions that need to be made, the sentencing recommendations that need to be made, and what is appropriate for that particular defendant. I think all of us on this stage would agree. People don't need to go to jail for 20 and 30 years on every crime. We need to look at the individuals that are in front of us, the defendants that are being charged, and make decisions about what's appropriate for that defendant. Does that defendant have mental health issues? Does that defendant have substance abuse issues? Does that ha individual have childhood drama or trauma that they have never dealt with? Only an experienced prosecutor understands how those things come into play in making those decisions. So it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, and that's what I would tell the voters. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I have the last question of this round for you, Ms. Behenna. Uh, current District Attorney David Prater has charged and prosecuted a number of elected officials during his time in office. He clashed with a judge who was ultimately removed from office, and he recently investigated the Pardon and Parole Board and an, with an Oklahoma County Grand Jury. Has Mr. Prater been justified in these pursuits, or has he waded too far into politics, as some people critique? You know, the role of a prosecutor is to investigate and prosecute crimes. When I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I investigated a number of public corruption cases. There is a role for a prosecutor and law enforcement to review the actions of elected officials. I don't know the facts of the cases that Mr. Prater's office has brought, and I'm not going to speculate on what the facts are and why he brought those charges. But absolutely, a district attorney, particularly the district attorney of Oklahoma County, knowing that many uh, in the state legislature sit here in Oklahoma City when they're making decisions, absolutely that office ought to be involved in prosecuting, well, investigating and prosecuting when the evidence presents that somebody has been involved in public corruption. As I said, I did that a number of cases when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. I prosecuted both Democrats and I prosecuted Republicans. Again, it doesn't matter what their political affiliation is. The facts lead where the facts lead. Based upon those facts, during the investigation, charging decisions should be made based upon those facts. Again, it doesn't matter who you're trying to get at or, or who hurt you or who you don't like. That is not even in the equation that a prosecutor should make. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Miles, the same, <clears throat> same question to you. Has Mr. Prater been justified in his pursuits that involve uh, corruption of political matters, or has he waded too far into the political arena? The outside appearances are that in some situations he's probably been a little bit more political than perhaps he should have been. But again, I too don't have all of the facts in those situations. I was a little bit surprised with uh, his decision to go after the pardon and parole board. Um, my sense was that, and the sense of some other people, was that um, he wasn't happy with some of the decisions that were made by the pardon and parole people, and as a consequence he went after them. Uh, the question is, was there something corrupt about what they were doing? Uh, again, I don't know the answer, but the measuring stick should be, is somebody doing something wrong? Is somebody doing something inappropriate? The office of the district attorney is a very powerful office in the state of Oklahoma by virtue of its proximity to the state capitol. And it's incumbent upon whoever occupies that office to do the right thing based upon what evidence is out there, based upon whether or not there are credible uh, allegations of wrongdoing. And uh, you referenced a couple of judges. Um, I can think of three judges that have stepped down over the course of about the last six years. Um, I can't speak as to why they all were, um, received the uh, attention from the office of the district attorney, but um, uh, the relationship between the district attorney 
and the court, the judges in Oklahoma County needs to be professional. There don't need to be inappropriate relationships and the district attorney shouldn't be swinging his weight around or her weight around in order to get more favored outcomes by the office of the district attorney. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of round three. Round of applause real quick. And we'll conclude with uh, two minute opening statements. I mean, opening, we'll, we'll start a third debate. Uh, we'll conclude with <laughs> closing statements. Uh, uh, Mr. Miles, you were up first, followed by Ms. Okay. Behenna. Thank you. So thanks for having the debate tonight. I think it's good, it's valuable for the people here and the people who are, are watching uh, on live stream and on Channel 9. Again, I'm Mark Miles, I'm running for district attorney. I told you I'm running to advocate for justice, for fairness, and for accountability in the district attorney's office. It's vitally important that we do all of those things, and there's different ways to get there. I talked a little bit about racial justice. I think that's important. I think somebody, for one, and, and I'll say it, there's never been a black district attorney in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, there's very few black assistant district attorneys in the state of Oklahoma. There's just a very, very small pool. I think I'm a little bit more sensitive to some of those issues by virtue of that. There's a thing called implicit bias, and if you look around the state at all the different offices around the state, that implicit bias is there, and I've seen it because I've practiced all over the state and in federal court, and you see what happens in different counties around the state. That's a challenge. I would like to bring a little bit more of an awareness of that culture to the office of the district attorney in Oklahoma County. When you talk about justice, that, I said it, we're talking about public safety, that's one thing. When you talk about fairness, it's important to treat everybody fairly and ethically. It, it's vitally important. And if you don't do that, then people lose faith in the office of the district attorney. We've got to have faith in institutions. And we live in a time where people have lost faith in institutions, in large part because of some of the people that have been elected over the years. And I'm not necessarily talking about just here, I'm talking about in other places. We've got to work really hard to fix that problem. I'm committed to fixing that problem. I want to hold the office to the highest ethical standards. I want to have a good relationship with law enforcement. I want to hold law enforcement to the highest ethical standards and make sure that we're doing everything and we're doing it right. And I am asking for your support on June 28th, and thank you again for having us tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ms. Behenna, two minutes to close to you. Thank you. Again, thank you all for being here and giving us the opportunity to have this debate. And thank you to the voters who are here who are listening to these debates. I believe that we are at a critical point in our state's history and our nation's history. I think many people have lost faith in the criminal justice system. I think people believe that the criminal justice system is target-based as opposed to evidence base, I believe our criminal justice system must operate with integrity and fairness for everybody. It doesn't matter where they live, the color of their skin, or what we believe their background is. As I've said many times during this debate, facts matter. Prosecutors should be driven by facts and evidence not for retaliation or not just because we suppose somebody did something wrong. I was a federal prosecutor for 25 years. I know this job. I know how to use the weight of the prosecutor's office when making charging decisions. I know how to make sentencing recommendations based upon the individual sitting across the table from me and what their background and experience is. I've been a criminal defense lawyer. I see how addiction, substance abuse, mental health, and childhood trauma can lead somebody into the criminal justice system. I've done post-conviction work. I understand the mistakes that can happen during prosecutions. I've had a family member go through the criminal justice system, and my family has actually been the victims of violent crime, with my husband getting shot in the line of duty. I have moved through the criminal justice system in Oklahoma, not because I was patting a resume or for, for political gain, but because my heart moved me to these new challenges to try to do something better, to try to make a difference. I want to be your next district attorney because I want to make a difference. I want you to have trust 
in the system, and I want you to know that there is somebody sitting at that head office who understands the power of that office and uses that appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to both of you for having this conversation. Public Debates Matter. Thank you to News 9, all our media partners who've shared this. Thank you to everybody who came here, our sponsors. Uh, we have two weeks until Election Day, uh, June 28th. We have three more debate nights. Uh, tomorrow night at OCCC in Southwest Oklahoma City, we have the two uh, Republican candidates for Attorney General. On June 22nd, we'll be in Bartlesville for the second Congressional District Republican primary. And lastly, June 22nd, we'll have a GOP State Superintendent debate at the Waterford in Oklahoma City. I want to go home like all you do. Thank you very much. <laughs>